The subject of the day, fabric as a medium for beauty, gives me the opportunity to think about, to talk about two of my favorite topics. Beauty, specifically beauty and music, which is something that I have devoted my whole life to, and musical texture. Texture is a word that music has borrowed from another sense and the one that we associate with music hearing, the sense of touch. And I think of musical texture as being the fabric that gives music its meaning and its depth. In music, texture encompasses so many different things that it's just really hard to have a concise definition of it. But some of the things that it encompasses, they're all things that have to do with sort of the general overall sound of music. Some of the things are orchestration. What instruments are playing? How do they double each other? Tone color. Uh, do we have two or more independent voices of line happening at the same time, uh, which we call counterpoint? Are there a lot of notes happening in a short amount of time, which we would call very active uh, texture, or is it slow moving? Uh, are different instruments far apart from each other? One's way down here, one's way up here. Is there a space filled in between them? Are the notes all sort of clustered densely together? Uh, ways that sounds are articulated? Are they short? Are they smooth, legato? Um, all those are things that have to do with texture. I'm committed to the idea that the quality of the material is important in creating a good piece of art. But uh, a good melody all by itself, thank you, is uh, very unlikely to, to actually convey uh, what the piece is all about. And so, for example, here's a melody that uh, is undeniably good and probably we would consider it beautiful. It sounds like this.
I think that we can't even hear a melody that we know out of context without having our mind's ear fill in everything that happens with that melody. Here's a melody that even without its accompaniment is just sensuously beautiful. hearing something more like this. a good melody good. I'm reminded of a line from a poem by Peter Kelso, whose youthful poetry I have set to music, who wrote this when he was 11 years old in the 1960s. A good poem must haunt the heart and be heeded by the head of the hearer. He was obviously a young poet who was kind of obsessed with alliteration. <laughs> but I like that. And I like it because what he says is so true. In addition to that, that line from that poem has haunted my heart since I first read it some 30 years ago. Still, what are the qualities that make that happen? What makes something haunt your heart? I've thought a lot about what makes a good melody good, in large part because it's something that composers don't automatically do anymore. For hundreds of years, People didn't need to be how, taught how to write a good melody because it was just part of what the language of music was in any era of any style. But in, in the last few decades that it has stopped, regardless of whether it's classical music, jazz, pop music, uh, the skills of melody writing, <coughs> writing have, have, diminished, <coughs> sorry, have diminished and uh, have just... Uh, there are very few people that are still writing melodies that are interesting, that are good. I was thinking about uh, a few decades in our relatively recent past, the decades that produced what we call the Great American Songbook, some of those songs we heard when we were coming in today, um, <clears throat> when it seemed like it was impossible not to write a great melody. People who weren't even official composers were cranking out these beautiful songs, and uh, I wish that those days would uh, come back, and I think that they will. <clears throat> melody writing is a skill, like anything that's involved with creating art. It doesn't just happen all on its own, and therefore it's something that can be taught. That isn't to diminish inspiration, which of course is of the highest importance in creating anything. But it's very hard to access inspiration unless you have the skills of what you do. Just like a violinist who is playing Mozart isn't going to be able to do it in a very inspired way if they haven't practiced their scales and arpeggios, haven't learned how to produce a beautiful tone on the violin, have not figured out how to make a phrase grow and move uh, a composer who doesn't have the skills for writing a melody is going to have a harder time accessing inspiration as well. So here's what I have observed. A good melody has an interesting shape to it. A good melody is unified in its material. We hear the same kind of patterns over and over again. But that has to be balanced by some level of unpredictability, surprise, variety. A good melody has a clear climax to it. A good melody has a sense of beginning to it and a sense of ending. 
A good melody has what I call character, which is that ineffable quality that makes this melody unlike any other melody ever written. As you can tell from what I'm saying, I'm a very melody-oriented composer. All of my, almost all of my pieces, not all of them, but almost all of them start with a melodic idea. And I work with that until a point at which I am satisfied with the melody and immediately start to think of textural ideas. Uh, sometimes I construct melodies, by which I mean I may take a little cellular idea uh, like this melody from the opening of my piano quartet, uh, these three notes, and I'm repeating that one. I use that shape over and over again in the in over and over in the melody. The next thing that happens is those three notes transposed up a little bit, and the order changed. Another version of those three notes. So on. Sometimes a melody just comes to me kind of fully formed. I don't know exactly how that happens, but it does. Like this one. This is from a piece of mine called Late at Night. that are part of this, um, and this is what I came up with. 
uh, I'll stop it right after it changes scale into another one that you'll probably notice is different uh, when the violin is playing pizzicato. <coughs> Thank you. 
actually wrote all of the piano part first and added the other instruments later. And even though the texture, the, the accompaniment is really the star of this particular piece, I still think of it as a very melody-oriented piece. And in light of this conversation, it seems even like a big piece of fabric somehow to me, the piano part. When I first met my composition mentor, Alden Ashforth, when I first came to LA in 1974, <clears throat> he asked me right away, what do you want to accomplish as a composer? And I had honestly never thought about this one bit. <clears throat> I just knew I wanted to be one. So I said, well, I want to do what <coughs> Berg and Foray, two of my favorite composers at the time, and still two of my favorite composers, what they do. And he said, oh, you want to move people. <laughs> I realized that there are all kinds of different goals for artistic expression. But Alden hit the nail on the head with me. Um, I don't think I comprehended really the depth of what that meant. Um, but it has turned out to be true for me. And I realized that what I've always wanted for my music is for it to be beautiful. <coughs> And by that, I mean, I wanted it to move people and to touch people somehow. <laughs> 